So now we have come to day 18, which is our last day together in this course. I've really enjoyed our time together, uh, and I look forward to continuing to read your comments. Um, the theme for today is the standpoint of non-duality, and the spiritual law from Sir John T T Templeton is nothing can exist apart from divinity. Um, in, uh, today, I'd like to talk ab about um, a spiritual concept, the notion of non-duality, which has, uh, in the last perhaps 20 to 30 years, and certainly uh, in the last 50 years, become very important in the religious traditions of the West. The notion of non-duality, and there's a Sanskrit word for this, advaita, which means non-duality, literally, they're not two-ness. It, it, it implies that there's only one reality, one unbroken, unfragmented reality, that at its base, at its core, there's only one uh, spiritual consciousness of which everything is a part, in, in which everything participates. But even more profoundly, there is no everything that's separate from other things, there is just this one reality, and, and we are all it. In uh, the Upanishads, it says, um, I am Atma Brahma. It means that this self, this soul, this internal consciousness that we experience as ourselves is ultimately and fundamentally identical with divine consciousness. Now, this is a radical and even revolutionary idea for much of the spiritualities of the modern the modern world, which have generally been grounded upon a sharp division between, between God and the soul, or between the divine and the self. And certainly in the scientific variants of this old religious understanding, there's generally this notion that we are bodies with perhaps some kind of internal uh, function, maybe it's a function of the brain, that is qualitatively different in some odd and mysterious and hopefully explicable way in the future uh, that's distinct from our, our physical bodies, mind and body. And that, there's, uh, and that the divide is unbridgeable between them. Well, non-duality, this idea uh, from India, an ancient I idea from India, implies that all of these divisions that we take so seriously ultimately are resolved in pure spirit, in pure consciousness. Now, I encountered this idea originally in, in, in Hindu uh, context, Vedanta, Advaita Vedanta contexts, uh, by reading the Upanishads and through some of my teachers, but also through in, in Buddhism as well, particularly uh, later uh, forms of Buddhism. That's a very controversial question as to what Buddhism ultimately is, but what is sometimes, what is often called Mahayana Buddhism, Buddhism, this notion of non-duality, uh, that life is grounded in a, in a non-divided consciousness, and that salvation, enlightenment, moksha, nirvana, um, freedom, uh, is ultimately direct the remembering that we are this consciousness. Right now I'm that consciousness, as you are as well. But I'm distracted by all of these kind of moving parts here, if you will, to think that what I really am is this uh, a, a mind that's associated with this particular form. This is the standpoint of the greatest saints in human history. It seems, it's odd to say, but if you, if you, look at the lives of, of history's greatest sages, saints, and mystics, it does seem that in one way or another they, they do converge in their own way upon this non-dual awareness. Because uh, one way to think about a saint is to, and I'll use saint as the most general term for holy people, one characteristic of saints is their love. And, they're, and the greater the saint, the greater the, the love they have for all beings in the whole of life. The greatest saints have no enemies. The greater the saint, the fewer the enemies. It's, I've been saying that for years. To be a real saint means to only want the best for all beings, even the person who might harm you. That, of course, is not everyday consciousness. To attain that state of awareness would require the altering profoundly and fundamentally in our own, our own consciousness. It would require a complete revolution in our values. And in fact, it may seem even distasteful to many to think of loving the one who would hurt you, to love your enemy, to use an old expression. Um, but again, this 
this notion of non-duality. It's a radical spiritual principle, but it's Sir John's as well. As he says, nothing can separate, nothing can exist separate from divinity. That is as good an expression of non-duality as there can be. Non-dual consciousness in a, in a context of people who are theists, who believe in a personal God, can seem quite challenging. Um, because in those contexts, it seems like there's an eternal division between God and the creation. If you will, it's as if one were to say, God is God and I'm not. And non-duality kind of shatters that, that, that grammar, if you will, and says that there's a deeper truth. Um, it's another way of putting that would be to say that for a traditional devotee, um, God is God and I'm not. Um, but for a non-dualist, it's not that God exists, it's that only God exists. There's only God. And the greatest mystics in Islam and in Christianity and in Hinduism, the kind of uh, mystics uh, who have been caught up in, in ex ecstasy for them, <clears throat> for the Marguerite Peretz and for the Meister Eckharts and for many others, this has been the truth that they've converged upon. One of the uh, implications of a non-dual vision in life—oh, by the way, before I move on, I will say that I wasn't raised Hindu or Buddhist. I was raised Catholic in New York. I had a traditional Catholic uh, school, parochial school upbringing. Uh, and what I derived from my Catholic upbringing, without even realizing it, only later when I became a philosopher and a theologian, did I see that I had, I had I had gotten a kind of Thomistic integralism, the idea that since reality is one, God is one, there's only one God, all knowledge and all of life ultimately is harmonized, integrated in, a, in the beatific vision. That's what I derived from my upbringing without realizing it at the time. And it's this that predisposed me towards a non-dual and a dueta perspective. One of the deeper implications, and I would say challenging, but I would say also needed for our time, is the notion of religious pluralism. Now, I've been deeply shaped by Hindu, Buddhist, and Christian spiritualities of varying schools. These are the religious traditions, if you will. These are my grandparents. You know, I have three grandparents, and I love all of them. I couldn't choose one grandparent over another. It's not like I would say, this grandparent is the only grandparent, the others are not my grandparents. No, all of these traditions have shaped me. And, I, and I am, I'm deeply respectful of all three of them and of other traditions as well. But I, as, I, as with the grandparent example, I don't choose between them. I don't set one over against the other as the final truth. How could I? Reality is infinite. The divine is infinite. Even our language is so limited. What is ultimately real seems to call forth the creative energies of all of these universes. In this universe, from the singularity till now, and who knows how many universes prior to it and how many universes after us. All of that creative energy, it's all an expression of the fundamental spirituality of life. And from that perspective, I won't say all religions are true. I would just simply say that I am able to derive from all religious traditions the inspiration to live a fuller, richer life and to orient myself towards the great saints of those traditions and, and the values uh, of kindness uh, and care for others and for the world in which I live. This is what I derive from the great saintly figures of the religious traditions. And so for me, religious pluralism is a fundamental fact of life. There's no way that I could regress behind that standpoint. Even if I were to try to think of one religion as the final religion for me, I would, I've tried that in the past when I was younger. One of the other religions will slowly, like maybe a grandparent visiting at a different time of the year, come and I suddenly find myself caught up in that world of spirituality and wondering how I could ever have left it to the side. So I do recommend religious pluralism, not as a way of coaxing people to leave their religions, but as a mood, as an attitude. We recognize that all of our religions uh, sort of like the kinds of flavors of coffee that we like. It's all coffee, but you like this kind of coffee and you like that kind of coffee. That our religions are like that in some gentle sense, and that each of us can be spiritual human beings, making use of the traditions at our disposal, but without 
insisting that ours is the only one or the final one, which only leads uh, to stress, it leads to uh, uh, discord, and ultimately can even lead to violence.